saddest comedies I've ever seen. Them. <laughs> I, I wouldn't call it comedy. But it's, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that's funny until it's not, and then it's not funny at all. Moving on to Steve, um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could tell us um, what kind of delving you did into the mind of John Pop. Can you talk a little bit about what your ideas were about what was going on inside this guy's mind? I think he was a very tortured individual. I think um, there's a lot of speculation about his mental state and... Uh, you know, it's it's your it's your best estimation as to who someone might have been. Um, there was a lot to be uh, looked at uh, in terms of research material, the books that he had written, and uh, he had a documentary commission on himself. And one of the most interesting aspects of that was the raw footage, the, the things, that the, the parts of himself that he did not want to be seen publicly. Um, that gave me probably more insight than anything as to the type of person that he was, the way he was instructing the crew, the way he was going through his lines in his head, trying to, um, trying to establish an identity for the camera. And... Um, so things like that gave me a, a little more insight uh, as to the type of person he was. How much access did the film have to, I guess, background material? Uh, we see a video, we, obviously you had access to that material. Was it difficult to get that access? Were there any kind of uh, conditions or, or no-go areas? Many people stepped forward to help us. The person who conducted those interviews and assembled those documentaries, his name is David Doc Bennett, and he's actually in the film. He's the one that's conducting the interviews with DuPont and uh, with David, meaning Mark Ruffalo. That's the actual guy, and he was the person who gave us all of that footage. But I hardly encountered a person who was not generous in sharing whatever it was that they had to an extent. What about the DuPont family? Less so. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, um, I ran into a, uh, someone who introduced themselves to me as a DuPont uh, in the Target store in North Hollywood, California. <laughs> I was just, I was buying, I don't know, no plant or something. <laughs> uh, and he introduced himself and was, was was very pleasant and was curious, um, but not not confrontational in any way. Well, to, um, in a way to follow up on what I just said about um, cooperation with the DuPont family, presumably this is not a film they're dying to see or dying to see, you know, get made. Um, so that must have presented some challenges. No, no. <laughs> there's nothing insidious, you know, there's no real attempt to block or stop us. The sense watching the film is that, that Mark has become a kind of, is, is essentially um, become a father figure. I'm, I'm sorry, wait, Mark, Mark Ruffalo playing accountable. Yeah. Mark, that's confusing. Um, so you become a kind of a father figure. You, you, you clearly represent a kind of a father figure today. And Dupont aspires or has pretensions to being a father figure. So there's this whole kind of issue of circulating in the film around fathers and absent fathers. And I'm, I'm curious as to what your, if you, this, this characterization, this, this dynamic, 
uh, is kind of an accurate reflection of, of the facts or whether it was something that, that was kind of more of an invention. It's a, a pretty close to factual as, as it could possibly get while condensing a, a, a little bit bigger story into a two-hour uh, movie. But the nature of their relationship, I think, was, was, was pretty spot on. And, um, you know, they were sort of left to their own devices very, very early on, uh, you know, not taking anything away from their parents. Uh, and I'm sure they did the best that they could, considering who they were and the time period that they lived in. But um, they really had only each other. And it was very clear, you know, Dave said, uh, or people have said that by five years old, uh, Dave was already taking care of Mark. And they were shuffled around a lot. Uh, at one point, there's a famous story of them living out, outside in the garden shed uh, of their uh, mother's home because it just became uh, intractable to live to live inside the home with uh, the boyfriend who, who neither of them got along with. Uh, and um, and they were basically all they had to rely upon and it was, it was each other. And uh, and I think just naturally, Dave. Uh, took that that position uh, because there was there was no one else there to do it ultimately. Did you between you and Steve was there an attempt to kind of work up the idea of this kind of rivalry over who was going to be um, the father in this strange relationship, this strange love triangle, maybe? No, we didn't. You know, a lot of it just came out of the script, and and and, and we were just sort of following the blueprints of, of, the, of the script, and the, that whatever that dynamic was 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 a mysterious one to us to some degree, uh, but but clearly uh, built into the structure of, of of the piece, and then through Bennett's um, guidance and direction, uh, manifested itself in different ways throughout. Um, Channing, um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you develop, develop the character. There's a certain physicality there, um, there's a really interesting gait, but one of the things that's most moving about this character and, this, and your performance is how vulnerable this guy is. And I think it's the vulnerability that's really the most important aspect of the character. So I wonder if you could talk about how you explored that. Um, you know, it's difficult to uh, to talk about Mark Schultz um, and then talk about my character as well. I, I found it very hard to do um, because it, well, one of the first, um, I guess, nights that we got to spend with Mark Schultz, uh, we all went to dinner, uh, Ben and, and Mark Ruffalo and myself, Mark Schultz, and after after the dinner, we were all walking down the street in New York, and um, and then I, I was, I think I was just with me and Mark Ruffalo started hanging back, and, and he's like, "Look at the way he's walking, like, just look at the way he walks." I'm like that's, it's just a, such a beautiful indication of just how he goes through the world, and you know, and I just started studying just everything about his movement, and you know, I, I found that that was probably the just, I guess, the way in for me. On, on Mark, he's such a, a physical and emotional, tangible um, sort of person. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't try to get into sort of, I guess his, his intellectual side. You know, I really just he's such an emotional person. I guess that that's really what I came to try to. Um, I, I I also wanted to ask you and um, and Sienna and uh, and some Michael Hall um, about. To the degree to which you had contact with the characters of the real life people who, who you were playing, um, and what what benefits came from that? Um, I uh, met Nancy, who I play, um, pretty pretty uh, close to starting shooting. She was actually there on my first day, which was exceptionally intimidating. But um, she was very generous and very open and very willing to share her feelings about all the characters and and it was just a real pleasure to be able to meet this woman who was who was so willing to be 
you know, to impart this, this information about for all of us, I think, for Mark, playing Dave and for me, and, um, and she's incredibly resilient and strong and fascinating. So it was, it was very fortunate to have the opportunity. Did she have things to share with, with you, Bennett, that went into the, the screenplay at, at any draft stage? Yes, much. <laughs> okay. And here's, here's, and listen, there is, the film itself is the tip of an iceberg, you know, and um, yeah, we had to sort of, with the actors, construct, you know, the big picture. And so the amount that she, and, and so many others, but she and her children, and Mark Schultz, and many of the wrestlers who were down there, uh, and, and others too, uh, really gave us an education uh, about the, the full life stories and many things that would not be included narratively in the film, but would, would inform uh, what was happening. Uh, but are there, Anecdotes that she, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Um, Anthony, what about, uh, did you ever meet Jack, whoever Jack is? Uh, I, I have to defer to Ben here and, and, uh, and just in front of it, but I believe it was a fictionalized character. I don't know that he was um, a real guy. But uh, I just enjoyed being a part of this, working with uh, such great talent. And I really, as an actor myself, you know, you kind of approach this very cautiously, and I just wanted to kind of key on to the tone of what Bennett was creating. So that was, for me, one of the most uh, interesting dynamics. I kind of know where I was getting a lot. Sometimes Bennett just like, back off a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I kind of watched what Bennett was doing in a, in a great uh, cinematographer program and worked with us. And I was really studying all these great actors, so I, I start by listening and kind of just watching. Um, and then Bennett had great things and a lot of details that I kind of saw. And, uh, I mean, the whole, you know, it's a, such a team effort as we all know, and there's you know, so many people involved, so um, it's just a pleasure to be collaborative. Um, and Vanessa, um, you're only in the film in three very brief scenes, but you make a tremendous impression. Um, it's, a, it's a very haunting presence that, that you created, and I wonder if, well, you, are, you channeled it. Thank you, but I didn't really. <laughs> um, what attracted you to being a part of this project? Sorry, what's the chance to do? What, what attracted you to being a part of this project? <laughs> uh, the script. Um, I knew I wanted to be in it. Um, I wasn't quite sure how or who the lady was, that's why I said, I hope you didn't take it as it was rude. No, I didn't. Um, whatever, make the character, no. Um, because although sometimes an actor or actress, as I insist on an actress, um, <laughs> you do get something and you know, okay, I, I get it, and then you listen to the director and everybody else, because you must, that's booming. But in this particular case, I couldn't know without listening very carefully and continually to Bennett, and I think I probably sensed I went, could have gone off course now and then, and just said whatever it was he said. <laughs> Which is why I mean, I didn't... I didn't make it. I mean, a really fantastic film. I think this is a masterpiece of a film. Um, it, it's the film that makes it, and the director, and who they gather around them. It's much bigger than anybody, but there's only one guiding one with producers, hopefully. <laughs> There's only one guiding sort of pilot in the in the boat fishing in the darkness. But up came this well. Sorry, what a stupid reply. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, thank you all for the wonderful work. Um, I have a, 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 the crafting of the film right here. Uh, the crafting of the film is so exquisite and so high 
qual caliber that uh, the actors, each one of their commitment to the role and the insights they bring to it is very clear for the work that was done, as well as on every other level. But I wanted to ask Ms. Redgrave and Mr. Bennett each a question. Ms. Redgrave, in the scene where you come to the gym, you're sitting there and you're watching like an owl, your son, what insight did you have to Mrs. DuPont? And to Mr. Bennett, there are so many levels of desire in this film that very easily could have taken over and become dominant, and you doesn't happen. I'd like to know how you balance both in the script and in the direction that the play of all the different desires that are going on in this film. Do you, do you want to take the... Yes, I depended absolutely on on Bennett uh, directing me how I should be. And I don't know what was in Bennett's mind, but I know that that's what was required. And I intuited that it must be allowed that in having watching this whole scene, um, would have their own reaction to what is going on in the mother's mind. And that that must not be imposed upon the audience. And I love that kind of work, but that's what I think it was about. Um, you just said something and helps answer the other part of that question, which is... that the performance does conceal something and that it does leave space to project onto someone. And that the various desires of the film uh, could very easily spill over and dominate, you know, as you pointed out. As could so many of the themes and so many other Elements it could very easily tip over to like a drug thing, or like was there some kind of like sexuality that was developed about that, or was it an innocent thing? But when these things become too dominant, flagrant, or spectacular, I find that they sort of erase the allegory uh, and they invite a kind of conclusion to things. And the film very much doesn't want to, uh, you know, wave its finger at the audience and conclude anything. Uh, rather, to keep staring at these things uh, that tempt us, I think, to react, to conclude, to you know, label and designate and good and evil. And, you know, sometimes making a film like this, you know, you're very tempted. Towards the low hanging fruit, you know, you feel like a cat wanting to like bat a dangling feather or something because, but that's cheap. And to restrain from that and just say, okay, but then what's behind that? And what's behind that? Uh, and, and for to allow the space for every character to make the best case for that character and, and hopefully witness something behind. Uh, the dynamic that resulted in this terrible conclusion. We have time for two more questions. Start with Clayton. Uh, my question is for Steve Burrell, um, right here. Uh, your filmography has included a lot of comedy, like the Sunshine, 40 Year Virgin. Uh, how eager were you to get to something so serious and dark like this? And how did you approach it as you approached your other films in the past? It wasn't part of my master plan. I wasn't. I don't have a master plan. <laughs> but uh, it it sort of fell in my lap. I wasn't lobbying for it. Like vaguely, I'd heard of the the incident. I'd heard the story when it, it happened, but then it then it went away. And uh, and it was presented to me. I I sent the script. I met with Bennett. We discussed it and. Um, and it was very intriguing, obviously, and, and I thought a real challenge, and 
Uh, getting the chance to work with him was, was uh, a, a huge draw for me. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't something that I was jockeying for in any way. I'm sorry. What was the second? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, how did you approach doing something dark like this as opposed to, you know, comedy slapstick? In the, in the same way, really. I mean, uh, it, in, in terms of, of preparing and understanding as much as you can about what you're about to do and the tone of what you're going to do and, and, uh, and then, then once you get there, kind of letting it all letting it go and not not thinking about all the preparation when you're doing it and uh, just try to make it genuine um, as best you can. It's our final question right here. My question is for Mr. Miller. Uh, all your movies are uh, based on true characters. Is there a specific reason for that? I think it's coincidence, but I do like examining real events, and uh, real events have sort of become the purview of different kind of storytelling, and, you know, news or infotainment. And, Personally, find leave me wanting, you know, leave me unsatisfied. And you compare the coverage of this particular story and what's available to uh, <coughs> traveling around and meeting everybody who's involved and getting to know deeper and deeper about who these people were. It's what, it's what I was saying before about the conclusions of things that. You know, with a lightning fast impulse to like look at a story and conclude like this is this is this you know and, and just turn it out for consumption and then find the next thing that gives you that little fix and uh, living in a world with so many with so much noise and so many stories and so many things I just I do have a tendency to want to grab something as it's flying through and just like sit down and like Really, uh, love it, you know, to really pour a ton of care into something that is um, otherwise receding into the recesses of memory with you know, just tiny little bits of evidence that I think are inconsiderate of uh, the lines involved. Mm -hmm.